we have arrived at another pop culture phenomenon episode. Odds are you've somehow heard of It's a Good Life, even if you've never seen it. The signature lines, characters, and premise are probably as well known as the Twilight Zone itself. This episode has been parodied, homaged, given a nod to, remade, and allowed a rare sequel in another Twilight Zone series. It's a good thing you did clicking on this video, guys. It's a real good thing you did. Rod Serling opens this installment on screen to set everything up. A monster lives in Peaksville, Ohio. This monster has either destroyed the rest of the world or isolated Peaksville completely. It has the power to read minds, create, combine, or obliterate matter, and send anyone or anything it doesn't like into the town cornfield, never to be heard from again. If anyone in Peaksville even has a bad thought about it, the monster knows. It's totally and utterly unstoppable. This monster is known as Anthony Fremont. He's a six-year-old boy who has an entire town under his thumb to the point where everybody always treats him nicely, or else. Just ask his Aunt Amy, who at one point in time had the boy under some sense of control, but after singing aloud one day, one of the things Anthony hates most, she was turned into a smiling, vacant shell of a person. If everyone else isn't careful, they could be next. Or worse. Director James Sheldon re-teamed with child actor Billy Moomy for their second and final collaboration on this show. Their first was one of the best of the six videotaped episodes in season two, Long Distance Call. Moomy played another creepy kid in that episode named Billy Bales. Here, that's all pushed to 11. Moomy gave a career-defining performance under Sheldon's direction in what Bill now calls his favorite episode. This is still one of the pieces both creatives are best known for. I hate anybody that doesn't like me. Don't make any noise when the music's playing. The rest of the cast is spectacular. The different levels of horror they play on their faces, always subdued with a smile and happy thoughts, seamlessly show the viewer what perilous danger they're all in on a daily basis. John Larch, the recently late multi-generational talent Cloris Leachman, Don Kiefer, Alice Frost, Max Showalter, credited as Casey Adams, Janine Bates, and Tom Hatcher are amazing as they interact with Anthony and each other across the installment. Well, howdy, Anthony. There's a silent panic to every delivery, of varying degrees, of course. A great scene shows this off non-verbally when Anthony is making TV for the people in his house to watch. I loved how this played out. Only thing we didn't need was actually showing what was on the TV. Those sounds, left to the imagination, are much scarier than the dinosaurs shown fighting. This is really the only case of showing too much, as they keep most of the gory details Anthony creates off screen. While Sheldon and the cast made this installment a classic, the script deserves plenty of credit too. Rod wrote the teleplay as his first to be produced for season three. It's based on a 1953 short story by Jerome Bixby. Some details are changed here and there, most notably the age of Anthony from three in the story to six in the episode, but most of it was left alone. You can't argue with the results. Shortly before his death, Serling was trying to adapt this story into a feature film. In 1974, he was interviewed by Marvel Comics where he described being on the third draft of the script. It's too bad we never saw that film, but I'm not so sure it would have been better than the episode. It's commonly ranked among the best of the series and recognized as one of the best episodes in television history in a 1997 TV Guide issue. Although, in 1983, this story did get adapted for a segment in Twilight Zone the movie. It was directed by Joe Dante, featured a familiar face, and went bigger and more abstract with what Anthony created. I like it, but it just feels more... 80s, which isn't a bad thing. In the third Twilight Zone series that started in 2002, they made a sequel to this episode called It's Still a Good Life. It centered around the same situation 40 years later and saw the return of Bill Moomy and Cloris Leachman in the same roles. Anthony has a daughter in that story, played by Moomy's real-life daughter, Liliana Moomy. Outside of those official continuations, this installment has been referenced in some way across all types of media. One of my favorites is the Johnny Bravo segment, Johnny Real Good. 
If you think bad thoughts, I'll make you go in the cornfield. Thank you, in the cornfield. Yeah, what a brat. What the? If you've ever ridden the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror at a Disney park, you've seen some of this episode in their pre-show video. Tonight's story in the Twilight Zone is somewhat unique and calls for a different kind of introduction. They got voice actor Mark Silverman to replace Serling's vocals, but they did use a few of the lines from the intro to It's a Good Life and placed Serling's on-screen appearance in front of the elevator. At a birthday party for the local Dan Hollis, Anthony becomes angry as the birthday boy gets drunk and starts talking back to the kid. Dan tries to keep the boy's attention so someone would take a lamp or a bottle or something and end this! But no one is brave enough to attack Anthony, and Dan is turned into a grotesque human jack-in-the-box. Mr. Fremont begs the kid to send what was once a person to the cornfield, and his son obliges. It then begins snowing outside, courtesy of you-know-who. Mr. Fremont almost snaps at the boy, saying it'll ruin half the crops, but his wife holds him back and Fremont praises his son by saying he did a good thing by making it snow. And tomorrow, tomorrow's gonna be a real good day. <laughs> the episode ends with this little monster still in complete control as everyone around remains powerless to stop it. So that Jack in the Box sequence is probably the creepiest of the entire show. They smartly don't show us everything, but it's just enough to absolutely freak me the hell out. The shot of Dan pleading with the other people just before his transformation builds the tension perfectly. The underlighting was set up in the previous shot by having him accidentally knock over a lamp, and that gives his final moments a dose of visual horror. Don Kiefer's performance here is incredible. Monster you. You dirty little monster. You murderer. You're a bad man. You're a very bad man. Nightmare fuel for sure. If you haven't seen It's a Good Life, it's time. It's well past time. It's one of those influential pieces of TV history where you'll point and go, oh, that's where that's from. Or if for some reason you've never heard of or seen anything about this story, it just holds up 60 plus years later. It's a quintessential part of this series and cannot be missed. In addition to the direction and acting from all parties being striking and layered, the use of diegetic music, background details in the set, and overall atmosphere can be enjoyed on repeat viewings, so rewatch it if it's been a while. I'm not sure if there's a perfectly executed episode of this show, but It's a Good Life may just be it. And that's a good thing they did. A real good thing. Just uh, make sure you keep it inside the Twilight Zone.